Would you join me in a responsive reading of the First Chronicles? Praise be to you, Lord. Lord, our God, everlasting, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty of this world. Everything and Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. Your salt is the head of the world. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power. To exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks.
Corinthians chapter 5. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You can go ahead and have a seat as we continue on with our worship. Well, today I get introduced to somebody who is uh, very important to me, and it's, it's interesting how college life goes, because there are probably a few of you in the room who know Derek, and, uh, but he's a recent grad of MCC 2015. Yeah. Is that correct? So uh, that sounds like a long time ago to most of you, but not to some of us. So uh, Derek is a recent grad, and I, I want to tell you just a, a bit about him so that you understand um, what kind of guy he is to me. And uh, any time that you get introduced to somebody, uh, there are all kinds of things you can draw from. Fair enough? Okay. So uh, I decided to be nice. And, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I decided to be nice. And I want to give you a little bit of, uh, of, of my heart for him so that you know him too. Uh, in, um, in the spring of 2015, I, I met Derek for the first time. And uh, I met him at the time when I was teaching part-time here, but he had never been my student. But I was a, a, a lead pastor at New Community Christian in Salina. And it was, uh, I believe, the summer of 14, and uh, we were in a moment as a church where uh, it was a tough moment, and we were replacing a position in our church that um, it, it, was, it was just a hard time, and we were putting somebody in a position um, and trying to find the right guy. And so uh, I interviewed Derek in a C25 classroom. First time I met him, we sat there at the tables and talked. And uh, in the process, I, I really came to, to see his heart, um, his heart for people, his love for people. And um, when it came down to it at the, uh, in uh, May when we went to hire, um, there were two people who had applied for the position. One was Chris Pauls and one was, uh, was Derek Burney. And uh, we had one position and we hired both guys and we created a position for the other one. And uh, you can ask them which one got it and which one got the other <laughs> position, but um, ask Derek and Chris both. But the reason why I tell you that story is one of the things that I found in ministry is that you surround yourself with people who love the Lord deeply and who love people, and uh, you find out ways to work together to serve him in his kingdom, and Derek is one of those guys. So uh, let's pray and uh, ask God for blessing. Father, we do thank you for the kind of work that you do within people and the way that you connect us to one another, and we pray, Father, that today you would connect our hearts to this message being spoken. We know that Derek is your messenger, and we pray, Father, that you would speak. We pray that you would speak in your word, and you would speak through the words that Derek chooses. And in all of this, Father, we pray that we are compelled to walk in faith, compelled to know you, and to love your world more and more because of this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Dave alluded to Chris got the job that I had originally applied for. <laughs> Uh, however, um, we did measure our hairlines before um, he, he uh, accepted the job here, and uh, my hairline is further up than his. Uh, it might not look like it, but it is, so um, just, just know that. Um, but anyways, yeah, so I'm the, I'm the youth pastor at New Community Christian Church. I love working with teenagers, um, and what's awesome is in this room right now, there are some, some of you guys that I got to the privilege of working with as teenagers um, when you guys were going to... Um, uh, Manhattan High. I actually even worked with you in Awanas year, uh, when you were a little little tiny guy. <laughs> I got stories about you and you don't even know it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you're embarrassed, aren't you? Uh, I just want to know if somebody is. <laughs> uh, but anyways, so I love working with teenagers um, and that's, that's my passion. Um, but today I want to share with you guys um, a sermon that I uh, that I think is so important for every single one of us. Um, it's this idea that I uh, that I came 
into uh, about, a, about a year and a half ago, um, maybe uh, yeah, about a year and a half ago, and it's, it's this idea of um, what did Jesus actually accomplish on the cross? <laughs> so that's the question we're going to ask today, um, and we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, your smartphone, you can flip to Ephesians chapter 2, um, and, and we'll be in verse, we'll start in verse 13 here in just a second. Um, so Paul answers this question of what did Jesus accomplish on the cross? And he answers it in a way um, that is a little counter to what we typically think of. Uh, a lot of times when we think of Jesus dying on the cross, we think of Jesus overcoming our sins, Jesus reconciling us to God the Father. Um, and those are all really, really awesome things, but that is not the only thing that Jesus did while on the cross. <coughs> so often... We view the cross as being one-dimensional, about God reconciling us, or about Jesus reconciling us to God, the vertical dimension of the cross. Um, that is not the only way. There's also a horizontal dimension of the cross that we're going to be talking about today, of God reconciling us to each other. Um, so... I remember uh, when I was a middle schooler, my dad was one of our basketball coaches, um, and there was this kid on our team, uh, his name is Travis, and Travis was in home ec class. Um, you you know one of those students who like were in home ec class but you would never try their food? Like that they cooked? Travis was one of them. And so anyways, Travis one day brought to basketball practice um, a plate of chocolate chip cookies. He walked straight up to my dad, and he said, Hey, Coach Bernie, do you want to try some cookies? Who's not going to turn down a chocolate chip cookie, right? And so, of course, he took like three of them and like chomped down on them and spit them all over the basketball court. Why did he do that? Well, because Travis proceeded to tell him that he accidentally put a cup of salt in instead of a cup of sugar. <laughs> salt is a really, really, really good thing. It helps you when you, when you cook your meat. It helps you like make beef jerky, which is absolutely amazing. Um, salt is so important, but too much of a good thing can be a really bad thing. Um, and so I know this sounds a little crazy, um, but here's what I'm getting to. The vertical dimension of the cross is a really, really, really good thing. But if that's the only thing we focus on with Jesus dying on the cross, then it can become very hurtful. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verses, verses 13 through 16 say this, But now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. When we focus on the vertical dimension of the cross, it can lead to a couple very harmful things. Um, let me mention two of those this morning. The first, it can lead to spiritual narcissism. What do I mean by spiritual narcissism? It means that, that everything about your relationship with, between you and God is only about you and God. So if you're wanting to know, um, how do I grow closer to Jesus? Well, it's only between me and God. If I want to know how to overcome sin, well, it's only between me and God. If I want to know how to, how to uh, come to the Lord in prayer, it's only between me and God. And this, inter this, this creates in us this mindset that we don't need a church family, that we can stay at home on a Sunday morning and listen and live stream in some sermon um, from, from far away, not needing a body of believers to communion. Um, and I don't know about you, um, but the culture that we live in today is not a place where we should only be about ourselves. Because the culture continually tells us that everything is about you and you alone. And, and Jesus is saying that is not the case. So if we want to be followers of Jesus, we can't just have, we cannot be spiritually narcissistic. It is not just about myself and my relationship with God. Um, and and why, do, why is this the case? Well, we see in James chapter 2, uh, verses 15 and 16, uh, the, writes, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. 
If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? So the first problem of, of seeing only the cross as being one-dimensional um, is that we only think of our faith about being between me and God. And the second problem um, might even be a little more, uh, might be even a little bit worse, um, and that is of spiritual abuse. What is spiritual abuse? Um, well, by this, I mean using your own personal relationship with God to justify mistreating those around you in the name of the gospel, right? What are the two greatest commandments? We read this in Matthew chapter 22, um, where Jesus is asked, Teacher, what, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets came on these two commandments. So we like to say things like, I am so passionate about my love for God that I have to mistreat you because you are clearly a sinner. We use the first commandment to justify us breaking the second. And this is exactly what the Pharisees did. They were so committed to the first, the first commandment, uh, that they, they so visibly mistreated those who they thought were unholy. And the more and more that they mistreated them, the higher up these Pharisees were, were projected. They were put up on a pedestal for hurting those who they deemed as unholy. And to me, that is absolutely disgusting. But that's what happens when we disconnect the, the vertical and the horizontal dimensions of the cross. It becomes a justification for all kinds of evil. You know, we can look back in history and see how Christians used scripture uh, to guide them in mistreating blacks uh, by creating racial separation. Uh, they would say things like, oh, I don't hate anybody. This is what God wants me to do. This is exactly what happened disconnect to the vertical and horizontal dimensions of the cross. Because in Ephesians 2, Paul is saying that you cannot separate these two dimensions. Let's look at the text again um, and see which order these dimensions come in. So back to Ephesians 2, verse 13 through 16. Paul once again writes, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Did you catch that? On the cross... Jesus made two completely different groups one. And this is the horizontal dimension of the cross. This is the horizontal reconciliation that Jesus accomplished while dying on the cross. And I think this is so crazy because Jesus reconciled us to each other first and then us together to God. And so often we reverse the fact. We believe that God, that Jesus reconciled us to God first and then to others. And, and this is where we get into this mindset of, of I have to fix my relationship with God first before I can have a relationship with others. But why does Paul say that the horizontal should be first? Um, it's because this is the exact same ordering that we see all throughout Scripture. Um, in, in the New Testament, we see it in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Which reads, if you're going to worship God, then remember that your brother has something against you, then stop worshiping. Leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go first be reconciled to your brother, then come reconcile yourself to God. First is the horizontal, and then the vertical. And then the, in the next chapter, Jesus says, if you forgive those who have sinned against you, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you haven't forgiven those who have sinned against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Again, the horizontal is first. And then the vertical. 
And then in 1 John, John says that if you love God but hate a brother, then you are a liar. It is impossible to say that you love God but hate all people made in his image around you. It is insane to separate the horizontal and vertical dimensions of the cross. In fact, with Jesus and his apostles, they put the emphasis on the horizontal dimension of the cross. But why? Well, because all throughout the Old Testament, that's exactly what happened. Was it was all about the horizontal dimension of the cross, especially with the prophets. For example, many times throughout Isaiah, the Lord rebukes their worship, saying that they can't worship God if they're going to mistreat those around them. If we only ever emphasize the vertical dimension of the cross, we are missing half of what Jesus did on the cross. And this leads us to our second point. If the cross, if it is the cross that leads us to reconciliation, then why are we so tempted to build our communities on things other than the cross? Paul speaks about this um, in many of his letters and hits on it here in Ephesians chapter 2. The real division here is between Jews and Gentiles. Paul speaks about the Gentiles as those being far from God. Why? Because they weren't they weren't Jews. They didn't have the Holy Scriptures. They didn't have all these feasts that you guys have learned about in, uh, in maybe Chris Paul's Old Testament class. If he's doing the job, is he? Oh. Oh. Just kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know he's not talking well. Um, anyways. <laughs> I'm kidding, Chris, I love you. <laughs> the Gentiles didn't know what God was really like. They hadn't experienced him. They didn't have a place called the Holy of Holies. They didn't know the character of God, but the Jews did. They had a clearer understanding of who God was. But they still didn't live like it. They knew that they had to allow the Jews to be followers, or the Gentiles to be followers of Jesus, but they didn't want to do that. So what did they do? You guys all know. You all know what happened. Is The Jews said, well, the Gentiles have to first become Jews so that they can then follow Jesus. And Paul says that that is absolutely absurd. Because if you have to become a Jew first, then the cross isn't what's reconciling. The cross isn't what's uniting the church. What then would unite the church would be a shared Jewish culture. The diet, the language, the traditions, the symbols. And if something other than the cross unites the church, there must be something deficient with what Jesus did on the cross. If something other than the cross unites the church, then there must be something deficient with what Jesus did on the cross. And this is why this, this whole idea really, really gets to Paul here in Ephesians chapter 2. Because Paul tells us that what unites the church is the cross, not the shared cross. And just like early Christians, we so often have the tendency to build our unity on something other than the cross. We want to be a church uh, based around a shared language or culture or leader or vision or values uh, or, or a shared way of praying or singing or voting. And if we build our unity on any of those things, then we are guilty of idolatry. We're saying that the cross isn't that to follow Jesus, we must all look the same, act the same, speak the same, dress the same. The temptation is to build uniformity by all doing the same thing. And if this is what, uh, and if this is how we live our lives, then we are saying that Jesus is not enough. So I ask you today, what do you demand from others before you will fellowship with? What binds you together other than the cross? Do you want someone to believe like you? Do you want someone to speak like you? Do you want someone to vote like you? If these are your prerequisites, then the cross is not at the center. How much of the way that we practice our faith is rooted in the cross, and how much of it is, is manifested because of what culture you know, it is extremely difficult to work through the idea of what is centered on the cross and what is centered on culture. 
You know, an immature Christian looks at how they practice their faith and says that, that their way is the correct way and that it is God's way. And if that's your attitude, then everyone else has to leave everything else at the door before they can become as good of a Christian as you. It takes a lot of maturity to realize that your way might not be the correct way. That your way might not be the best way. So welcoming people in and learning from them is extremely important. Especially if we're going to focus on both dimensions of the cross. So now knowing these two truths about Jesus' work on the cross, and knowing that there's, that there's two dimensions of the cross. There's this vertical dimension of God reconciling us to him. But first, there's this horizontal dimension of us, of, of Jesus reconciling us to each other. Um, and then the fact that, that this cross is what our church should be focused on. That, this, that is what the church is united around. What does that look like for us? How do we live in a world where so often we don't focus on the cross? Well, we must be united to one another. We must set aside anything else that we believe. We must set aside anything else that, that we think is absolutely important and it is not necessary to what Scripture says. And we must build up our own lives. We must build up the lives of those around us so that we can first be united with each other and then together. So there's this whole idea of us being united to each other. What does this look like? How does this play out here at Manhattan Christian College? Well, I think the first idea is this, is look around the room. There are a whole lot of you here. There's a whole lot of you from from different, um, from different cities, from different states, from different family units, from different church backgrounds. Uh, there's some of you who, who play sports, and there's some of you who can't stand sports at all. There's some of you um, who believe different things about Scripture. But the reality is, is we must all come together, centered around the cross, fighting for what Jesus says and who Jesus is so that we can be united with one another. And if that's what we're going to focus on, then that's how the church is going to continue to grow and spread. It is not through, through lights and, and, and fog machines or, or us saying the right thing or, or us preaching the right words. What it's about is us uniting Because if we're able to unite together, then we are able to much more easily unite with God and see who he is. Uh, my wife, Emily, she always, she always tells me that she always says, the easiest way, the best way for us to see Jesus today is through each other. And if we believe that, if we believe that we see Jesus through each other, because we are his image bearers, we reflect his image, we mirror God then we must treat each other the same. If we truly believe that it is a cross that unites us, then we will treat each other, we will treat churches, we will treat one another the same way that we would treat God. Yeah, there's a difference there. We're not God, right? We bear his image, we reflect his image. That's different than us being God. But we must treat each other with the same reverence. We must treat each other with, with respect so that we can come together to understand and proclaim the sacredness of who our God is. It is only through Jesus' work on the cross that we are able to be reconciled first to each other and then to God. Join me in prayer. <laughs> Father, we love you so much. 
We are so grateful for who you are. Um, we are so grateful for your son. And we're so grateful for the words that Paul wrote in Ephesians. Lord, we understand and we know that, that we are broken people working together to bring you glory. And Lord, through that, may we set aside anything else that we believe. May we set aside any, any prerequisites that we have for Christians May we come together to be united, to share your name, to bring you glory, to bring you praise. Because God, ultimately, what we desire and what we want is to be united with you. But as Paul states, we must first be reconciled and united with one another. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give you all the praise. Pray these things in Jesus' name.